Thank you very much, Olivier, for that very generous introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, can I first say what an honor it is to be here with you this evening on your 30th anniversary. I've avoided using the other word. And to join with you in celebrating tonight. It's particularly an honor to be with you in these very, very beautiful surroundings and in one of Europe's most lovely cities. Thank you for inviting me. I bring very warm regards from a number of people. Firstly, Richard Howlett, who is now CEO of the International Integrated Reporting Council. He would have loved to have joined you here tonight, as would the chairman, Barry Mellinson. And I also bring warmest regards from Eddie Weimersch, who is chair of the Public Interest Oversight Board. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to speak on the subject of trust in markets. My husband, when he heard that this was the topic, quipped that it could be a very short speech indeed. I'm not quite so pessimistic. But clearly, there are a number of challenges to trust in markets, and tonight I'll share some thoughts about those challenges and hopefully some solutions. I'd like to refer you to a wonderful speech by Andrew Haldane, the Chief Economist at the Bank of England, in May this year. In The Great Divide, he discussed trust in markets. He said, let me start by discussing why closing the trust deficit in, financial, in finance matters to the economy and to the society. Whisper it quietly, he said but a large and well-functioning financial sector is absolutely the essential foundation for a growing and well-functioning economy. This is not an ideological assertion from the financial elite. It's an empirical fact. Evidence has emerged, both micro and macro, to suggest trust may play a crucial role in value creation. At the micro level, there's now ample evidence that the degree of trust or social capital within a company contributes positively to its value creation capacity. At the macro level, there's now a strong body of evidence looking across a large range of countries and over long periods of time that high levels of trust and cooperation are associated with higher economic growth. Put differently, a lack of trust jeopardizes one of finance's key societal functions, higher growth. Tonight, I'd like to address the role of the accounting profession in encouraging and ensuring that there's trust in markets. As my friend and co-deputy chair of the IIRC board, Peter Backer, President of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development recently stated in the Harvard Business Review, accountants will save the world. He said, if the world wants to address our many challenges, if business wants to restore society's trust, business must be more transparent and acknowledge that the resources we exploit or conserve and the social benefits we engender or lose must be factored into a company's value and thus into day-to-day -day management. This is not a matter of incremental change, but a radical transformation. And it's the accountants who will lead the way. Working within global standards, the setting of which is overseen by the Public Interest Oversight Board, and I'm honored to be a member, your skill, scrutiny, professional judgment and skepticism, with the focused spotlight of high ethical standards, enable you and your profession to give a level of confidence to market participants which is unparalleled. You're able to ascertain and evaluate risk and provide assurance to capital market participants, important factors which underpin these markets' success. Tonight, I would like to outline some of the challenges we face and share with you some thoughts on solutions. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we live in very strange times. Many of the norms and truths we thought self-evident are being disrupted in ways which would have seemed unimaginable even a decade ago. The disruptions we've seen in business through technology have resonated in the political sphere. The emergence of Uber and Airbnb seem positively tame when compared with the echo chamber of social media redefining news and the emergence of post-truth politics. The Twitter sphere and Facebook have replaced the newspaper and credible evidence-based journalism for many people with all the distortions that that can deliver. The convergence of followers of both the right and the left into highly skeptical, anti-globalization and anti-establishment, ideology-free, anger-driven forces, squeezing out the center has transformed the global political landscape. Lies and truths seem fungible and a rather dystopian view is reflected in many places. All of these changes have not encouraged confidence and trust in markets. And these developments come at a time when growth is slow or halted, with the economy in the US predicted to grow at about half as fast as the economy of the past 70 years. Economists are arguing amongst, their, uh, amongst themselves as to whether slow growth is the new normal. Larry Summers notes the objective of increasing growth has even been discredited in some circles. He considers there should be, a po should, there should be policy objectives for increasing growth. Others, like Paul Krugman and Thomas Piketty, disagree. Some note that no single policy will return the US to post-war growth which was fueled by the baby boom and the entry of women into the workforce. Globalization is increasingly blamed for job losses, rising wage inequality, and sluggish GDP growth. It's these issues which have contributed to the political disruption mentioned earlier. So ladies and gentlemen, what is to be done? As in a recent report on the global economy, the Economist has said closing borders would cause a great deal of harm and do very little to tackle irregularities in the economy. Blocking imports would lead to enriching market power of rent-seeking firms and further harm the prospects for higher produ productivity and pay. It's quite clear that policies have not kept up with globalisation. Stability in the labour market needs macroeconomic policies, not cutting trade. It needs governments and businesses to take responsibility to address those left behind. It's clear that the issues of inequality need to be tackled head on. Support needs to be provided for people caught in the transition of industry by effective retraining schemes, enforcing competition policies to facilitate startups and new companies, working to reduce tra tax arbitrages which encourage otherwise pointless company relocations and develop global standards on taxation and capital controls. Danny Roderick of Harvard University suggests the way to build public support for globalization may be to link trade pacts with the development of global norms on taxation. The G20 has addressed similar challenges. In an open letter to the G20 leaders in August this year, the Financial Stability Board chairman called on the G20 leaders to address some aspects of the global economy. He called for more reliable financial services. A global financial system changing to rely on more on markets and less on banks further attention to reforms, especially too big to fail, support for a more resilient, inclusive globalization built on sustainable cross-border investment. He included in the specifics 
improved climate change financial disclosure, addressing financial sector misconduct, and managing the financial stability implications of new financial technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these things are matters that accountants have a major opportunity to influence. Each issue falls squarely into your remit as accountants and auditors. The focus on climate change disclosures is a very welcome one from the perspective of those who see climate change as the greatest existential threat to mankind we'll see in our lifetimes. Some of the most impressive work in this area has been done by members of your profession. The work done in the standard setting boards, in the GRI, in the A4S, SASB and other bodies, as well as that done in the International Integrated Reporting Council, has set the scene for full global adoption of congruent, comparable standards for climate change disclosures. To my mind, there are some other areas where accountants will be able to play leadership roles. As well as climate change disclosures, the issues of inequality and the labour market challenges of technological change reflect the policies and practices of business. The disclosure of the social capital of business can indicate the way in which business are rising to the challenges of their role as leaders in our communities. These will reveal the role business is playing in assisting to address the inequalities that may arise from business decisions. This transparency can only increase in business confidence. The development of benchmarks in this area is not as well advanced as in the environmental area, but it could be argued that they are equally important. Further work by accounting experts in this area could be very important in establishing the consistent reporting of these important indicators. Encouragement by the profession of holistic reporting in the form of an integrated report will definitely encourage trust in business. Financial sector mismanagement is also an area where the professional scepticism of the auditing profession is vitally important. The financial stability of new technologies will be a major challenge and opportunity to the profession and businesses more widely. Every aspect of business will be radically transformed over the next few years. The transformational nature of the developments of cloud computing, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things and other changes just over the horizon will frankly astound us. It's only the beginning of a revolution which will change our lives probably even more profoundly than the Industrial Revolution. It will change the role of accountants and auditors profoundly as well. As we reflect tonight on the achievements of Accountancy Europe over the past 30 years, I congratulate you. They are very impressive indeed. I suggest we look forward to the next 30 years. Recently, at a meeting in China, it was suggested that if we fell asleep for just five years, we would not recognize the world we woke up in. Technological change is happening so quickly that every aspect of life is being transformed. In a world where sheets of figures can be transformed into narrative in a millisecond, where Watson, the IBM computer, is devouring the US re regulations to assist the SEC with regulatory options, where financial product development is encouraged to, to build algorithms into the product to enable the regulator to check on them, the changes to the world of accounting will be no different. What a magnificent opportunity you have to shape the 21st century role of the accountant to the one you would wish it to be. I wish you well in the exciting world of accountancy for the 21st century, and I fervently hope that Peter Backer is correct and that accountants do save the world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.